ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, whether you're watching this uh, in a hybrid mode from abroad, remotely, or here in person, uh, thank you for being here and welcome. It's really my pleasure to be a speaker today, a moderator of, with such distinguished speakers that, who will uh, speak about how hard they work to implement uh, their net zero uh, strategy in their companies and to fight climate change. After all, today's uh, and this conference in general, the theme is net zero transition and how companies, governments and others uh, and us as individuals and consumers um, are taking an important role and playing an important role to lead this energy transition. And today we have three champions of that cause whether it's them or the companies they have under their watch led their respective companies towards fighting climate change by um, basically uh, putting together or, and, and implementing a policy of ESG, net zero, and very ambitious ones. So uh, to my left, I have Mr. Uh, Roy Harvey from Alcoa, one of the greatest uh, you know, aluminum production companies in the world, uh, needs no introduction. Uh, and uh, uh, what I can say of uh, Mr. Roy is that he's uh, what they call a, a true Alcoan, right? He's been with Alcoa for more than 15 years uh, and a true loyal. And he's you know, worked at different managerial positions uh, all the way to the top executive, has worked uh, as a smelter manager and now today all the way uh, to CEO. And uh, under his watch, uh, he'll talk to you about the net zero policies that they've, uh, thanks to his leadership, implemented. Uh, we also have <clears throat> Matthias uh, Midrich from Umicor, CEO of Umicor. Matthias has a, a history of working in uh, clean mobility in the automotive industry. And as we know, uh, clean mobility is one of the cornerstones of, uh, of this fight against climate change. We all drive cars, we all take planes, we all, you know, not all of us go on ships, but some do. Uh, but, you know, there is a movement towards uh, electrification of transportation. And once again, Matthias has been a leader in that field, and he will uh, tell you all about that. And we talked about electrification of transport. Well, at the heart of that, you have a company like British Vault and its founder and CEO, uh, Mr. Oral Najari. And he has uh, worked uh, all his life as a successful financier helping others, entrepreneurs like himself today to finance their ambitious and beautiful projects. And he's, one day he said to himself, why don't I work on this ambition I have, that I have to found a company that's ESG uh, oriented, that wants to be a major player uh, in this en you know, energy uh, transition and mainly also in uh, electrification of transportation. So British Vault uh, will, is working on building uh, the UK's first gigafactory for electric vehicle batteries. Uh, as for myself, uh, Ali Amade, I'm a partner at Denton, so the biggest law firm in the world. We have a commitment to, uh, and always had, to the fight against uh, climate change, to work and help our clients in uh, basically uh, leading them to this, in this uh, helping them in this energy transition, which is, uh, which is an important fact. And I'm uh, the leader also of our internal group uh, focused on lithium ion uh, batteries and battery storage as part of our tra energy transition group. So it's a pleasure to be uh, here today. Um, I think the first thing that I, the first question that comes to mind when we talk about uh, you know, energy transition is that we want to know what are these companies, all of them being such uh, you know, companies that are really in, in the industrial uh, sector of things. So they are definitely, by nature, uh, viewed as uh, real carbon emitters, right? And what are they doing to, to fight climate change and, and what policies towards net zero they're implementing? A lot of uh, people and, uh, see numbers, you know, net zero goals, 2050, 2030, 2035. Um, uh, whether it's the government or the companies themselves that imp uh, implement these, some say it might be too ambitious. Uh, and I, I'm sure that 
Our colleagues here don't think so. And they, if they've come up with such ambitious policies, they think it's realistic. So I'll start with you, Roy. What is um, the policy you've put in, in, in place at Alcoa, and why do you think it's realistic and feasible? Ali, I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about Alcoa. And I would just uh, start off with a, a couple quick points from, from your comments. First, I think any of these changes is always going to be very ambitious because it requires not just a, a good foundation, but also deliberate steps along the chain to make sure that you are, you are solving the problems, solving the problems of decarbonization, of the, the broader necessity to, to make our business sustainable, but also to make sure that we can do it in a competitive fashion and actually create value for all of our stakeholders, but also our, our shareholders. So it, it requires ambition and it requires a lot of effort. And I'd also go back, and you mentioned that we were champions and I look at it as a, a constant need to reinvent and a constant need to make sure that we are continuing to win. So I can't say I feel like a champion right now. I feel much more like someone that's running the race. And uh, Alcoa certainly has aspirations to be very successful. And I think we have policies that are pointed towards a, a very different future. But it's, it's going to just take, uh, it's going to mean need to mean that we run very, very quickly. Uh, for Alcoa, it's pretty simple. We're a 130-year-old company. We've been making bauxite alumina and aluminum, which sort of spans that primary part of the aluminum value chain for more than 130 years. Um, we do it around the world. Um, typically, it's been all sorts of different, different energy sources. Um, I think the way that the industry grew up, particularly outside of China, was through uh, was through hydropower, and so the original renewable power, and that was because of the the availability of power and also the, the, that you can very much count on it and it's not cyclical um, outside of rainfall patterns. Um, and so when we look at our starting point, it's a pretty good starting point because you compare us against half of the aluminum smelting industry in China, um, which is for the most part coal-fired power, which means there's this huge amount of carbon that is generated just because they're turning alumina, they're turning this bauxite, this aluminum dirt, into, into aluminum. So we start off from a good spot, but that's just the beginning. As we think about the way that the world is changing, the needs that we have to decarbonize, and also the need to make sure that we're doing things in the right way, we need to solve the problems all along this chain so we can reach what is our ultimate goal, which is to be net zero by 2050. And we have a number of R&D projects as well as a number of processes that we have under test right now that will not just use renewable power, which of course is, uh, is not easy in today's world, um, but more importantly also convert some of the direct emissions that we have today and squeeze them completely out. So our goal to get to net zero is meant to be without offsets. It's meant to be through the development of brand new technologies, many of them happening here in, in Quebec because of the great support that we have with the Canadian and Quebec, Quebecois governments. Um, but it means that we need to develop the technologies as we go, and 2050 seems a long time away, but also around the corner. Okay, great. And we'll talk about the specific technologies, maybe some examples as well, and I've, I've, I've read about your, your interesting stuff you've done in Montreal as well, so we'll talk about that. But uh, on to you, Matthias, what, what's your take on uh, you know, net zero policy, Absolutely. feasibility? Yeah, and, and uh, I want to follow the chain of, of argumentation mm -hmm. here because, uh, Roy, what you mentioned, exactly, it is a race. We're in the race. It is a very tough race. Mm -hmm. It's like running a marathon uh, below two hours, right? It's, it seems impossible, but it can be done. And I think there's a very important aspect that you said uh, that, that I think we will come later to it. It's nothing that a company can do alone, especially when we talk about mm -hmm. our type of companies where the scope three, so the supply chain uh, has a big order of magnitude of the uh, emissions. Mm -hmm. It needs to be a concerted approach, a more an ecosystem approach. And I think technology will be one of the, of the key drivers behind that. Maybe to Yumiko, it's not as well known as Alcoa probably. So we are a 200 years old company. Um, we have started out, we're a Belgian company headquartered in Brussels. We are today one of the largest producers of, of battery materials, so the things that go into uh, uh, the batteries itself. Um, and we have started as a mining company uh, in the Congo, actually, a uh, very long time ago, and we have transformed uh, into a materials, in a circular materials technology company over the last 200 years, where the last 20 years already were very much focused on sustainability. So um, I think there is... Um, 
uh, a lot that needs to be done in the whole value chain. Our scope one and scope two emissions, we have to fight them, but they are uh, compared to the scope three. So the whole upstream, everything that is going up to the mine, uh, there's a factor 10 in between. Mm -hmm. So when we really want to tackle that, we have to see how we can uh, decarbonize our supply chain. And this is in our policies. This is the main, um, the main goal that we have to team up with, with companies like British World uh, uh, on, the, on the battery side and then upstream with all the, the mining companies and everybody who is in this supply chain. Uh, and then at the end of the day, what is also for us very important is the closed loop approach. Mm. We truly believe in, in recycling being one of the key levers to make that decarbonization happen. Um, and, and with this, our goal would be to uh, towards 2030, we think it is possible to reduce the battery supply chain by about 75% to what we see today in terms of CO2 emissions to have at the end of the day what we really want, an electric vehicle that is really uh, carbon neutral and not needs 100,000 kilometers on the road before achieving that. So that would be our approach. Great, great. Um, Oral, so um, obviously British Volt is the result, the creation uh, and the implementation, the result of this energy transition and, and ESG is at the heart of your company. Uh, full disclosure, uh, Oral uh, and, and British Volt are a client of mine, so I've had the pleasure to work with them uh, in their North American uh, projects, so that's, that's a, it's, it's a pleasure. So basically, uh, Roy and Matthias, after this, you won't have to necessarily put up with me, but he still has to <laughs> deal with me for some time, unfortunately for him. So um, tell us about your vision of uh, your ESG policies and that's your transition. Uh, well, thank you for having us firstly, Ali, and, and it's been an honor and privilege to be working with Dentons in, 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 in Canada and also out of the rest of the world and UK. Uh, look, when it comes to net zero policies, I think firstly, British Vault compared to 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 the gentleman sat next to me, we're talking hundreds and two hundred years of experience. British Vault has its first employee July 2020. So we don't have decades, let alone centuries of experience. But that gives us some advantages. Gives us advantages in the sense that we have we, we have the ability to start on a clean slate, uh, on a clean piece of mm clean sheet of paper. Uh, we don't have any legacies uh, in, in, in order to pivot uh, through this, this energy transition from an era of internal combustion engine towards an era of electrification and immobility in general. And we can do that and become the next energy champion of the United Kingdom, being the only gigaplant proposition that is currently backed by Her Majesty's government. But in terms of net zero policies, if you look at the British full proposition, who are we, what are we? Well, we'll be producing cells. So when we produce cells downstream from us, we have the autos and the OEMs, and then upstream from us, we have you guys on the active material side. <clears throat> Point that you touched upon, we really do need to look at reinventing the supply chain, try to remove that embedded carbon footprint within the supply chain, especially when you're looking at mining technologies, mining methodologies. Some of these technologies and methodologies are actually going back decades and decades, if they're 50, 60, 70 years old. Uh, firstly, Canada has a unique, unique geographical uh, uh, advantage in, in, in becoming truly competitive within this re-industrialization space that we have ahead of us, hence why we're working very closely with Dentons in, 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 in uh, Canada. Uh, secondly, or thirdly, uh, circular economy, as, 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 as you pointed towards, we, we can't be digging out materials decade after decade after decade after decade. Yes, we do have some bottlenecks in the market. You're feeling the nickel squeeze, I'm feeling the nickel squeeze, volatility on prices is not helping to, 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 for EVs to kind of penetrate internal combustion engines. But we need to look one step ahead whilst we're doing this, especially being lucky enough not to have any legacy, being fortunate enough, being able to impose changes within the supply chain and then wrap it all up with a circular economy. So it's really a three-prone attack. But then again, I think it's the same for, for many of our peers in the business. No, for sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I think uh, technology uh, obviously is, um, 
the uh, theme of this panel and, and technology in your respective businesses is so important in this fight against climate change. I can say, for example, for us lawyers, it's interesting that uh, it's actually ironic and lawyers talking about technology and, and being green because uh, we're probably the most, uh, you know, uh, the least techie of, of them all, right? And uh, until before the pandemic, uh, being a techie lawyer was to send a, an Outlook uh, invite with a, with a dial-in. Uh, now uh, we were in Teams, and uh, thankfully the dial-in concept is gone uh, also. So that's, <laughs> that was an annoying one. But in general, I mean, I have colleagues who barely can type on Word, and they actually dictate or they have to, uh, you know, mark up things. And, and you, through the, uh, we had to force ourselves to, to adapt because of the pandemic and the human mind that can, can basically adapt to anything. And, and we have become uh, more techy. Uh, to, I mean, it's all relative, right? But also we're not necessarily the greenest. I mean, we like to produce paper, a lot of, a lot of it, and often a lot of it that's not necessarily useful and uh, sits on desks and no one reads. But, uh, but we try to, to be green in our way. But obviously our carbon footprint as a, as a you know, uh, business is not, is not great. But what you guys do obviously will have an amazing impact because you're decarbonizing in, you know, the, these heavy industries. I, I can think of like Umicore, former mining company now, and then the chemicals industry, uh, Alcoa, same thing, uh, you're with, your, with your Gigaplan, same thing. So uh, what are these technologies? Give us some examples, Roy, of, of, of what you're doing in that space. Yeah, and I think it's, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's a moment in time, I think, where, and you talked about using teams and mm -hmm. adapting how we work through the pandemic. It's a moment in time where everything seems to be changing so rapidly. And I suppose probably prior generations all thought the same thing. They thought the world was changing around them and it was hard to keep up. But I look at how the expectations about what we do, whether it's in the rainforest in Brazil or in Western Australia where we're mining and refining, um, or along the St. Lawrence in Canada, expectations and the transparency and the desire to see change just are moving at us at a pace that means we need to keep up and we need to make sure that all the way back to the value chain and again we we pick up the bauxite from the ground we turn it into alumina which is aluminum oxide and turn it into aluminum all along that value chain we need to solve to make sure that we understand the challenges for our communities the challenges for our customers our suppliers that we're solving those issues at the very root and that's where technology absolutely comes in is how we how we look at activities we've been doing for 130 years which used to be a lot but unfortunately with Matthias it's not that much <laughs> how we can take these same problems and develop them and solve them and so starting back in in the mining piece, I think we all understand how we can move towards electrification of trucks. The challenge there is really how you build sustainable relationships with communities. And to me, uh, ensuring that we have a level playing field, ensure that everybody's being held to the same level of transparency and the same expectations around around building those bridges and about finding a way that we can create common value is going to be the challenge on the mining side. But I think the decarbonization challenge is, is solvable. Um, on the refining side, which is the next piece in the value chain, um, we need to rethink how that entire process, number one, to move to renewable energy. Right now, it's we're almost completely natural gas, um, and we are by far the lowest emitter of carbon dioxide in the refining business today. But how do you then move that on to, to renewables? How do you take some of those peaks and values that you have coming from any renewable power source and make sure that you can not lose the traction of having a very competitive refinery? Um, and how do you manage residues? The other side is, is as we go through this bauxite, this mud, and you turn it into alum you, you extract the aluminum from it, you end up with what we call bauxite residue. How do we reuse that? How do we recycle it? How do we find ways to lower that footprint? We've been doing pretty good at minimizing, but we need to take that next step to completely eliminate. And so that, we call it the refinery of the future, but it is a collection of technologies that needs to reinvent the way that you refine. On the smelting side, um, again, when you smelting is essentially you take uh, aluminum oxide, alumina, you add a whole bunch of energy and you turn it into molten aluminum that you then pour into shapes. 
Um, the challenge, the first challenge that you have is use renewable energy. And that, you know, as we stand here in, in Canada along the St. Lawrence, an amazing amount of hydropower. That one, for us, for the most part, is solved, although there's still some work to do. The question, though, um, in the typical electrolytic cell, you are emitting carbon dioxide because you're using carbon-based anodes. Um, we're in the midst of a joint venture called Elysis. Um, we've been working on this for a few decades already, but we teamed up with Rio Tinto in the province of Quebec and the government of Canada. Um, and we're now developing Elysis, which is instead of emitting carbon dioxide, you are smelting aluminum and only emitting oxygen. And so that squeezes out that last piece of, of, of carbon emissions while at the same time is, uh, in, in our founder, we like to look at it and say he founded the industrial process for making aluminum, Charles Martin Hall. It gets back to a much better, more scientifically attractive and more cost competitive uh, method of smelting aluminum because you actually have anodes that are no longer being consumed to have to turn into carbon dioxide. You're running brand new material science, you're running a cell that is more competitive, and in the end, you can have a zero carbon product. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're all driving for because that then leads into everything that you need, and maybe not aluminum specifically, but that's the type of activity we need to be looking across all these different industries. Okay, thank you. So, Matthias, in your case, uh, technology, the new technology you're working on, how is that helping? Right. I think that we have a lot of uh, commonalities, what you just uh, said, Roy, on, on the matter of how can we decarbonize, uh, decarbonize our operations or our plants. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we have the same challenges that you have just mentioned. There are two others that we have in our metier, in our business of, of, uh, of the clean mobility. The second one is the product itself, so the battery material, the chemistry that goes into a battery. Of course, uh, there is the biggest lever if you could do the same effect, so the same energy storage, the same uh, density, the same safety, with materials that have a better CO2 footprint. Mm -hmm. So working on our product technology to have uh, batteries that use less nickel, for example, has probably a much higher level than uh, you know decarbonizing our own operations on a global scale. Now this is uh, this again comes to uh, the fact that we cannot do it alone. We do it together with the with the battery manufacturers and the OEMs uh, as an ecosystem. Th that's something that is uh, very important for us in the roadmap going forward. But there's a third one, which becoming more and more important, and it's not obvious in our business. It is data. Uh, why I'm saying that? Because when you work in a very complex value chain with a lot of ecosystem partners, things are get blurry very fast. So how would you know if you have a battery, what kind of CO2 footprint this battery has? Or it, make it even more complex once you recycle the battery and, and then everything is, you know, the material, you don't know what it's coming from. So that's why a very important piece of our technology work is on what we call the global battery passport. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not only us doing that, it's a, the, the Global Battery Alliance, all of the industry players are doing this together to make sure that you have traceability to the mine where the material has been sourced, all the processing in between in terms of CO2, but also in terms of uh, sustainable sourcing, especially in cobalt, that's a very you know, difficult thing or, or, or important thing to uh, source it only from sustainable mines. So, so data and the use of data uh, uh, in the whole uh, value chain, this is an important part where we put also our emphasis on. Certainly. Um, so, Aral, tell us about technology. It's at the heart of what you guys do and new technologies that we're developing. Tell us about that. So, so technology is key. Technology is key uh, in, 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 in the race to net zero because right now we, we don't have another efficient form of, of, of energy storage other than the lithium-ion battery. Uh, what will come in the future? I don't know. I'm not saying it's the only one solution, but this is the one solution we have today. And if you want to save the world, we have to start today with what we have. If you're going to sit there and wait and roll our thumbs, wait for the next generation, next generation, then we're going to come. Uh, that's, that's, that's number one. Num number two, in terms of technology then, um, if you look at the British Vault proposition, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a lot focusing on tailoring the, the, the cell chemistries uh, for the specific application uses on the other end. Uh, so one size doesn't really fit all anymore. We can't just go with the same batteries in a, in a Volkswagen, I don't know, a, a, a Golf and, and, and then 
obviously Bentley and Volkswagen are in the same group as an example and use the same batteries in a Bentley. Uh, you, this is a different price tag, it's a different application use, it's a completely different purpose. So one size doesn't fit all anymore. So in terms of technology and how can technology be a cont contributing factor for the race to net zero and decarbonization? Well, by being more efficient, being more lean. So again, coming back to what British Oil try to do is to really tailor that cell, cell chemistry for the specific application requirements of the end customer within e-mobility or st static and stationary energy storage. Then, then obviously, again, technology, we, we, we talked earlier about how, how, how that circular economy is utterly important. Uh, so we need to look at technology, technological advancements within recycling. Are we trying to focus on getting the cathode out and bringing it back to you guys to reprocess? Or are we trying to focus on getting right. the nickel out of the cathode as well and the cobalt out of it what are we going to do with the lithium that is the more tricky part of that recycling process but elon has a has an answer and as i say do what elon does uh, i'm sure you'll be fine <laughs> uh, and then just to rattle through we mentioned technological i mean within your industries processes are really really energy intense we're talking nickel sulfate processes cobalt sulfate what is then relevant for you as well uh, I think it's very important to make sure, because if you really think about it, uh, if we establish the fact that we need a lithium-ion battery as part of this energy transition, and that technological development is key, then we need to start focusing on the processes around it. The cathode, the anode, the full cycle cell manufacturing itself, together with the copper foil, these are extremely energy intense processes. So when you want to have a low carbon sustainable end product, then you need to be fully front loaded with renewable. So accurately, exactly what you guys pointed out is every step of the process, how can we ensure that we remove that embedded carbon footprint within the supply chain as we're reaching towards that net zero goal? But that can also that can only start through a decarbonization strategy. And then finally, what is utterly, utterly important, technology. These days, technological development has, 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 has gone to next level and, 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 and other levels that is above and beyond even my understanding. But we have blockchain technologies in terms of, of creating an auditable track record, a traceable auditable track record in terms of your embedded CO2. So for British Oil, we're working with a company named Circular, which I'm sure you're fully aware of as well. I think they're doing a very, very good job in really trying to nail down how much CO2 there really is within your full supply chain. So we're talking from A to Z, which then comes back to that battery passporting, which I think is going to be really, really important. Because from a British Volt side of things, we want the customer not to choose the car. We want them to choose the car because our batteries are in that car. Because we are making the low carbon, most or lowest carbon, uh, <clears throat> embedded carbon footprint within our battery. So. With, with that technology is important, and it's important right across the board. No, for sure. Uh, I'm mindful of the time, so I, what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll ask more customized questions for, for each of you. I'll start with you, Oral, actually. So us lawyers, uh, we learn a lot from our clients. You always talk about the challenge of industrialization in, for in, in the clean mobility sector and in, 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 in the battery sector and, and electric vehicles. In the way I understand it is that we have a lot, uh, we need a lot of batteries, we need a lot of these cars in order to achieve these uh, ambitious goals. Uh, we need to decarbonize, we need to go for this type of energy and, 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 and vehicles, but uh, the infrastructure is, needs to be built, right, for it, and we need to, you know, get to that. So this challenge of industrialization, tell us about it. I don't know if I explained it right, but you, you'll do a better job than I, I'm sure. <laughs> Tell you about it. Well, let's put it this way: if, if, if yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's something that keeps me sleepless at nights. Okay, it, it's an absolute utter disaster. This industrialization, because looking at our first proposition up in the UK, job one, as as as, as I call it, it's a ninety-four hectare site. It's the former coal power station. So the project is really called Phoenix Rising from the Ashes. We bought the the stockyard. And, and building a full cycle cell manufacturing capability. Uh, it, it will become the fourth largest building in the UK. Uh, 
the question today is not in terms of demand. The question today in terms of, of supply. And we need to solve a few bottlenecks within supply and supply chain. Number one, obviously, raw materials. There's is, is a massive squeeze in the market. First, the pandemic highlighted the importance of localization of supply chains. Then Putin highlighted the further importance of energy security. We have about 11% of global nickel coming out of out of, 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 of Russia. You guys have done a sterling job in trying to kind of work your way away from that. Whereas others have kind of got stuck in the weaves and, and it's difficult once you, you, you dwell into it. But going to industrialization then. So it's very easy to demonstrate the product in, 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 in laboratory environment. Then you need to, to start showing commercial viability of that said product. And where British Fault is taking a different approach is we see industrialization out of de-risk industrialization twofold. Number one, uh, we, want, we don't want to rush through scale-up facilities. If you, re, if, you, if you think about it, UK is very good at research, development and innovation have historically been so. In fact, they have invented the lithium-ion battery at Oxford, but they lost out on commercialization to Japan. In this case, the old Sony camcorders, if you remember, had a big battery in the early 90s at the back. That was the first lithium-ion battery. This time around, UK governments had the foresight. So what they've done is that they built an ecosystem and a platform. That's allowed British World to leverage a little bit on that ecosystem. So we have a UK battery industrialization center. It's a scale-up facility. This time around, whatever we invent in the UK as a British company through IP neutral facilities, we're able to uh, jump in from one step to another into UK BIC as an example. So one gigawatt hour facility, but not rush through scale up. We have another facility in Germany and I'm building a third scale up facility. Now, industrialization, as you would know, because the processes are so extremely complicated and, and, and so sensitive, if you're able to have real life industrial scale on your scale up facility, on your machinery and equipment, that's when you can really leverage that industrialization and de-risking that industrialization and glide path. Secondly, in terms of industrialization, how to de-risk that is obviously collaboration across the board with the likes of the cathode manufacturers, the anode manufacturers, so the midstream. You guys are not going to be able to do it alone, nor are we going to be able to do it alone. So industrialization is a big headache. Yeah. We are looking at various ways of de-risking it. We're extremely comfortable with our roadmap mm -hmm. of industrialization, but collaboration is required across the board in general. Yeah. That's good you, you mentioned that because uh, I wanted to also discuss, you know, we're in a world where, you know, as you explained, it's getting more and more polarized. There's all kinds of new uh, challenges. The, we're in the middle of, you know, there's a war going on right now, uh, more than one actually. But, and also, uh, you know, there's a, you can see a certain uh, new strategic relationships between governments being formed and companies also. Uh, so I know that, uh, you know, um, um, Umicore is working a lot at building these strategic uh, partnerships with ACC, with uh, all these uh, different joint ventures. Tell us a bit about that and what is this trend and why is it? Yeah. Absolutely. But before that, let me make one remark to industrialization because I, I find one picture very speaking, everything about battery cells or battery material making. The dimensions you need to put in place are the dimensions of uh, uh, probably more oil refineries. So huge, you know, fourth largest building of the UK, huge dimensions. But in the inside, it has to work like a pharmaceutical uh, company, right? So really uh, not parts per million, parts per billion uh, in terms of cleanliness. Otherwise, the batteries don't work. And I think this is the whole challenge of this industry mm -hmm. to scale up in a certain way. Um, now, looking to partnerships and value chains, so what we have seen that, uh, that uh, probably also because of what is known as the, uh, the chip shortage, the crisis in microchips, um, alongside with the scarceness of resources on, uh, on uh, the raw materials for electrification, what we have seen in the last, I would say, 6 to 12 months is a big change in, in this market in terms of uh, who is partnering with whom. Traditionally, the, this business was set up that uh, the, the mining companies were working with the cathode makers, so us, and we were working with the battery uh, cell makers. Uh, but in the last, as I said, 12 months, a new player came into the game, that, that are the car OEMs themselves. They have realized that there are two things they need to master to be relevant uh, in the, at the end of the decade. The one is software, 
and the other one is batteries in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And different OEMs have different strategies. Some of them go even into cell manufacturing. Others have yeah. close uh, partnerships and relationships with cell manufacturers. Uh, and others just want to influence what is going into the battery with specification. But that for us is something new. It's a new development that we work now directly with the, uh, most of the, of the car manufacturers uh, on, on these chemistries that if you want on the downstream side, the partnership. On the upstream side, um, our partners, we, we, traditionally we had always strong ties to the raw material industry because of our history. But now also the question of decarbonization brings us even closer together and, and some of the technologies you have mentioned earlier um, uh, get extremely important also to unlock uh, supply. i give you one example, uh, and, and you might know that already, uh, in Indonesia, there is an abundance of nickel, but this is uh, nickel in a, in, a, in a physical form that is not perfect, often to say very bad in terms of CO2 equation. Mm. And on top of that, uh, by geopolitical reasons, you cannot extract nickel out of Indonesia without doing a local processing here. Uh, so the, the idea is, is there a technology that mining companies, together with companies like us, could develop that uh, it's much more uh, CO2 efficient to get this out of the earth. And then in Indonesia and in other parts of the world, this can also uh, happen going forward. And, and as we said at the end of the day, we are all connected through, through data. And this, based on this, this blockchain technologies, this is another strong partnership that we see more and more evolving. And, and that's probably something we, we all need to agree on, on a standard very soon, uh, not that everybody uh, has its own uh, way to track all of these materials. Thank you. Um, Roy, one of the uh, challenges when speaking with leaders uh, of companies like yourselves uh, in this whole you know, decarbonization effort is that you have players like yourselves, uh, your companies, uh, who play by the rules, who uh, really implement and invest heavily in, in making sure, especially in, in your industries, uh, where you have to change your habits, you have to change your technology, you have to invest heavily, right? And you have to also buy from people who, who are as, you know, uh, have the same values, and obviously that costs money. So you, ha you have end products from your company that may, uh, in the market, end up being more expensive than these other companies that, for various reasons, whether because they're not, they don't have the same policies, they, don't ha they want to cut costs, or they're not subject to the same laws, uh, so it's a, how do we do uh, to create a level playing field in the market? Ali, it's a, <clears throat> it's a great question and it's really the crux of the matter about how you, how you drive a profitable and a sustainable business in the midst of all these changes going on around the market. So, so let me start with the ideal world and what we're working on from an Alcoa perspective and then add a little pragmatism or practicality to it. Um, in the ideal world, the, the technologies that we're developing that are decarbonized, that are more closely connected with the communities, uh, they reflect better economics. Um, it costs money in order to develop, and, it, and it's, it's, it costs money, and it also costs a lot of effort and ambition and, and ingenuity in order to turn ideas into, in fact, processes. But again, looking at something like Alesis, it is it is a better process. It will provide better economics um, it, once you connect it to renewable power, it will have, it will be simply a better way of smelting aluminum. And that's just exemplary. So in the ideal world, not only can we win because we have the lowest carbon product and we have what we call aluminum stewardship initiative, um, essentially a certification to say that we follow the right set of values and principles with our communities, whether it's Brazil or Guinea or, or Australia. Um, all those things come embedded in it, and you've still got a very competitive cost, and you still have a very competitive, competitive product. And we're, we tend to look at ourselves as commodity players, so it, it really matters what happens in the broader world. That's the ideal, <clears throat> and it's what we're running after, and I think, I think our ambition is to actually solve that. But let's, let's inject some pragmatism and some practicality. Um, we live in a world where when you look at the, the carbon curve, essentially where is most of the carbon embedded in aluminum, um, most of that sits inside of China. And you look at the stark difference between what we can produce um, without yet having all the technologies developed versus what China's producing because of the connection back to coal-fired power facilities, the difference is stark. 
Um, and I would argue that you have that same type of difference when you look back through the value chain about how you choose to mine, how you relate with local governments, how you build partnerships and, and the ethical principles and the values that are embedded in all those different relationships. And so you have a lot of players that are running, running forward with a very different set of principles. And unfortunately, and we've seen this in the mining industry over and over again, and the metals industry as well, is that we, we unfortunately find significant disasters that have had serious impact in places like Brazil or Canada or China or elsewhere that we learn from, we learn from as an industry, but we need to get ahead of these types of problems. We need the right regulatory environment. We need the right jointly, uh, jointly concocted and approved and implemented systems so that, so that we as mining companies, we as material companies, that we can actually start solving these problems and eliminate those types of problems, eliminate those types of tailings dams failures, things like that. Um, and so you need to, it gets back to partnerships, it gets back to connections with customers, um, we need to make sure that we will try to be as competitive as we can be. Um, but that competitiveness comes with a cost. Those programs come with a cost. And so the more that we can foster an environment where governments have high expectations that match the communities, that drive everybody towards these types of shared value outcomes, the quicker that we can stop these serious issues that are happening in the industry and the quicker that we can we can see the returns and see an acceleration of all the programs that we're doing in order to in order to decarbonize, in order to in order to drive all these different programs. And so it's complicated. It's absolutely not easy because we work in places like Guinea and Africa and Canada and Australia and Brazil. And each one of these has their own their own set of politics, their own set of expectations. But all of a sudden, everybody, even in the most remote village in Guinea has a cell phone and has the ability to take a video and to have an opinion and to have their opinion now, now voiced. And so I think that helps us drive towards this outcome where there's a level playing field, but we need to really nurture that as much as we can because that is what then allows us to have the confidence to invest even more quickly. All right, great, great. Um, maybe uh, just to develop further on that, Matthias, you you, sp you spoke a lot about scope one, scope two, scope three. Perhaps uh, 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 explain also for our, for our for our viewers what what that is. And uh, my understanding is that decarbonizing scope one and two is not as much the challenge as uh, scope three, which is the supply chain. Please explain a bit about that. Absolutely. So scope one and scope two actually is uh, the energy that uh, or the, the CO two emissions that you have in your own scope, so your own factories that are doing that, or the energy that you are uh, purchasing actually and using to drive your facility. So this is, it's, it's a big task, it's complicated, but it's in the hands of the companies that are doing that, right? So you could say the uh, degree of, of control is much higher than on the supply chain. Now, uh, in our business, it's in fact a factor 10 that is in between. So for our company, we have emitted in 2019 around 800,000 tons of scope one and scope two. And at the same time, 8 million tons uh, of scope three. So um, if you take that into account, it, it is absolutely clear that uh, the importance lies upstream. And the good thing is that all of those companies upstream their, from our perspective, scope three emissions are their scope one and scope two. So they have it under their control. Yeah. Consequently, we come back to the topic of, of partnerships. If you have aligned goals in that direction, you will be successful uh, to do that. And there is no question that at the end of the day, uh, the end market is asking for that. So the end market meaning the car manufacturers. And at the end of the day, the consumers, they want to have decarbonized electric vehicles even to an extent that it's today written already in the specifications when we receive uh, requests for quotation that so and so much uh, reduction targets need to be um, done. And once you do that, you create the pull through the whole value chain to make it happen at the end of the day. Let me give another notion, which I think is something which is not yet uh, so much talked about in, in public, because you could also say there is scope one, two, three, there could be even a scope four. A scope four would be, it's not existing, it's, it's, uh, it's just something that what the products that are you producing, how much CO2 are they avoiding in the, in the economy? So if we take our business, if we take your business, um, uh, and we made the math already, uh, actually if 
you see how many uh, tons of CO2 are saved because electric vehicles are using our battery materials, mm -hmm. it's even more than our scope one, two and three emissions together. And uh, that shouldn't be uh, an, uh, a reason to uh, decrease the work, the work on, on decarbonization, but it's also, I think, something that we should look on uh, in terms of judging if companies contribute to the global uh, reduction of global climate change or not. Mm. Amazing, great. Um, maybe another challenge we could speak about, it's not as much related to, uh, to technology, but it's definitely related to ESG policies and, and net zero. So um, we're in a world around where, you know, uh, shortage of workforce is a big issue, uh, whether we're in, in the legal field, whether it's in the industry, whether it's in, in, in whatever field. Today we <laughs> have things to be done, a lot to be done, but not enough people to do it, right? And uh, companies are working for, uh, basically competing for the same you know, pool of talents, right? So um, you have done an amazing job at, in, in two or three years, uh, you know, growing this beautiful team by 100, uh, almost 100 times, uh, if not more, and uh, building, uh, hiring a lot of uh, great talent and, and, and minds. And we know that the workforce is more and more, you know, formed of uh, millennials, Gen Z, and new generations that care a lot about uh, ESG policies, care, care a lot about you know, carbon footprint, care about, a lot about what their employer uh, how, uh, values in these, in these areas. So what do you, how do you think your ESG policies, your uh, you know, DNA, which is basically entrenched in, in, in ESG, helps you attract good talent? So, uh... <clears throat> It's, it's, it's going above and beyond just, just the E and, and sort of looking into S and G, so to speak. Uh, in, in, in terms of, of, of human talent, we, we have a global shortage now, don't we? So especially continental Europe is even worse than ever as one startup is taking talent from another startup and then they're jumping back and forth and inflating the salaries, which, which obviously is increasing our OPEXs in a already capex, upfront capex heavy exercise, uh, where, where British Falls has been extremely blessed, privileged, uh, is, is, is that we, we are that one champion of the UK, backed by Her Majesty's government, so we're able to piggyback on that British ecosystem, because there's also a certain degree of patronism within this, this kind of race to net zero, uh, we did invent the lithium-ion battery in the UK, and, and darn it, do, 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 do we hit ourselves for, for missing out on that, that industrialization and commercialization. This time around, in terms of British world, it is homegrown talent, creating homegrown IP. But because of the foresight of HMG, we, 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 we have that ability to demonstrate commercial viability uh, uh, domestically. Now, looking then at this, this Reindustrialization, because in the UK we're very lucky. We, we, we're ticking quite a lot of boxes. We're ticking the 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 the, the upskilling and leveling up agenda in the northeast of Her Majesty's government. So we're ticking a lot of those boxes. Uh, but generally speaking, it's a reindustrialization across the world. So we need to focus on upskilling, reskilling. So British Fault has just recently announced a 700 job. Uh, apprentice program with Northumbria University up, up, up in the Northeast. And this is where you really can go away from just focusing on the E, removing that embedded carbon footprint. You can start focusing on the S's and the G's in terms of social governance. How can we enrich the lives of our local communities? And also when we're coming, and obviously having been in Canada for a while, touch wood, Canada is extremely blessed in terms of employment during an era we, we, we're going through a recession now at the back end of a pandemic. Interest rates are going up at the back end of a low, low period of um, interest rates where inflation has, has, has risen drastically. But still, Touchwood Canada is very, very blessed in terms of good rates of employment. Uh, but if you look and analyze those numbers for Canada, how, how does a company like British Fulton go above and beyond the, the E in towards the S's and the G's? By, by, by looking at that demographic shift that we're also seeing, that younger population, urbanization, 
These are all signs and patterns, and 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 in 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 order to really highlight truly the ESG standards that British Fulton stands for, is when we do come to Canada as an example again. At the back end of 18 months of work, we have the foundation in targeting the right type of upskilling and reskilling in collaboration with the local counties and the municipalities. And that is really, really important as part of this next industrial revolution that we really get that next generation, as you say, with us. But generally speaking, I think in Europe, we're quite fortunate with regulatory frameworks being changed in the UK 2030 with the ban of the internal combustion engine. But that on one end, I always call political propaganda. What we have this time around, that next generation you, you're mentioning, is it was what I call the Greta Thunberg effect. So the Greta effect came at the same time as, as, as these legislative changes coming in Europe. Mm. So also just touching base on that leveling the playing field, I think it would naturally level itself out because everybody has access to a mobile phone today. If we do something wrong somewhere in our supply chains, they'll bust us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. I think we, uh, I'm, we're almost done in time, but uh, we've covered a lot of interesting topics, a lot of the challenges that uh, you Genice, gents and your companies are facing, but uh, you're in good place to overcome all of these and it's, it's uh, doing a great job. And uh, thank you so much for your time today. Hope you enjoyed it as well, as much as I did. <laughs>